Okay, so let's check in on the progress torch table, filament maker, and shredder. Okay, so let's start with the shredder. Uh, did a bunch of work on it in terms of CAD uh, yesterday. So if you take a look at, you can go through my log or OSC shredder, but here's the page. What it looks like is a nice little picture. Uh, that's kind of how the motors are going to be looking when. Now that's going to be like kind of like the business end of the shredder where you got the two motors driving and then the shafts and the rest of the the system but then the cad i put in all the individual parts so then it's bearings motor there's the double chain coupler shaft tube these are actually i took the dimensions off the off the actual uh, devices and try to just render it up as easily as possible and then ended up with the the overall CAD, which looks like like this. So here is the is the box with the motor. It's actually this is pretty technically correct in terms of dimensions and all that. Um, so that's kind of like the idea right now, uh, showing one motor coupled to the whole system, and what are some of the details. Um, so the lengths actually are pretty decent in this in this system. Um, can somebody actually go down and download? I'm having file uh, caching issues. What happens when you click on this? Because I'm actually not using the latest file. Um, well, actually, let me just do this because this file here, 166, <clears throat> that's the latest. What I need to do sometimes is re-upload another file over that so I can access the file by clicking on the second file in the version history it's a bug like I gotta download this one now the 166 yeah um, <clears throat> well I just I just did it I just uh, downloaded by I had to do the little cheat but here's the file in the chat box the cheat was uh, I re-uploaded this file that's just right now, 1001 here, um, but I have to click on the second one to download the second one here. Uh, I'm going to open that up because it's got a little update on in terms of the colors here. Um, with the green, yeah, uh, that, that is the latest. So what's going on here? Uh, trying to fit the, this is the shaft that we have actually and you can see you can see it's it's, uh, it's exactly 36 inches it sticks out about 32 inches from the double chain coupler so that here represents the double chain coupler there's the collar on top of that if you want to take a look at just for physical reference uh, just in the <coughs> photos just to get a close-up of this um, so that's the double chain coupler there. That's um, yeah, it's a good picture. Uh, so this the shaft goes in like this, into it's bolted with a three-quarter bolt through. That's a three-inch shaft. It actually ends up going all the way to just about there. But mm -hmm. within the CAD, that's what it looks like. So that's a double chain coupler represented there. There's the the bolt through with the um, it's it's a simple bolt through the shaft three quarter bolt but this length sticking out is about 32 inches so if you look at all the dimensions as they are this is kind of what it ends up being with the box so so we can actually read the dimensions of everything here like say the box which is right now currently 26 inches and then we have to analyze it and see okay does this all make sense well on the motor side yeah we're all good that's going to get mounted like uh, probably what we want to do here is extend this side with uh, probably half by eight all the way out to here and mount the two motors like as if this were an extension of the box otherwise you'd be relying on a table so you have to like use and make another structure that would be mounting but here we already have this rather stiff box that we're going to have we can extend it back simply just run it back and then uh, mount the motors how do you mount them there's that four four bolt flange there uh, if I switch to 
that four bolt flange it's like four and an eighth inch spacing but that's half inch bolts there but that's how he would mount it to go all the way back there for the mounting it's it's kind of inconvenient because you got all the, the shredder starts like right here so you got to go all the way back there to actually mount it um, I mean this is not ideal this is just basically taking off the shelf parts and these kinds of motor configurations in an ideal case you'd have uh, here in this motor configuration we've got this this plate cup this kind of weird coupler because this what motor came off uh, some wheel motor application and the only way you can couple properly to it they don't really have couplers for it but they do have these wheel mounting plates so we had to I mean the first story here is that we had to make up this whole contraption here where like a wheel we're back we're uh, mounting this double chain coupler as if it were kind of like a wheel structure with like these five lug bolts and so forth but it's a half inch plate with the lug bolts then there's like two inch shaft goes through that and this is actually a coupler that's got play like in between the chain there's a little bit of play so this is not a stiff coupler it's just like on a well it's comparable to the tractor but we don't have double chain coupler on the tractor but here it's like that's a really good coupler like it's super strong I mean many thousands of pounds of hold while allowing for quite a bit of adjustment it's uh, it's that the space where the sprockets go into the chain there's a little play there that while it's tough to uh, it's tight when you drive it uh, actually like it, it can bend back and forth a little bit so you got like any tension of this huge the huge forces that are involved here they, they get um, uh, you don't wear things out it, it, there's play there so it's a good idea I mean you could do something like a stiff coupler but then everything is super tight and all that it's it's nice idea in general to have flexible cu couplers so you can allow for misalignments and that way when you're spinning some heavy-duty element you're not putting a lot of wear on whatever you're spinning so then then you've got so the bearings are in, a, in this configuration here we're on the outside we yesterday we were talking about possibly putting the bearings on the inside but the way it is right now the tube is 20 inches and it's kind of like 20 inches or so here uh, if we measure that yep uh, and then there's those uh, tensioners like when we said we're gonna punch the blades together uh, clamp them together so they're tight against each other so those would be one one of these green structures at one end and what's happening there so once we mount the blades on the square shaft and the square shaft is actually that's the whole perforated whole tubing half inch wall around the three inch shaft same as on a tractor uh, tractor wheels actually so it's a geometrical shape around which you can you can mount blades uh, so when you mount the blades this coupler here let's maybe make it uh, make it a little more visible here So the, this coupler here, not, not this coupler, I mean, what do we call it? It's a, it's a tensioner or like a, what do we call it? Provides, provides tension. So, so how does it work? So you put the blade on, onto the, the square shaft, first blade. There's bolts that are going to go through these, these welded nuts. So this is a, basically a three inch piece of precision tubing welded to a, a ring and then bolts go through so it's that's nuts like this would be three quarter drew up three quarter but these three quarter nuts would accept bolts and you screw the bolts in and and as you screw in the bolts they would completely tension or press down on the blades so you're punching the blades together with a lot of force and how much force do you have there this thing that's missing here is this ring here will have to have another bolt welded to it so you can put a set screw into the shaft so you're holding actually against the shaft and a standard procedure for like uh set screws we can use a regular like a three and uh three quarter inch bolt typically you want to get them at an angle of like um like 60 degrees or so so they they kind of press down from two sides and that makes for a much stronger hold but that's not drawn in here so you've got this tight against the shaft this would be spinning the entire assembly is spinning so this clamp down it's called the the blade clamp down the blade clamp down will spin like the shaft spins all this the square tube spins the blade spin um, so this is uh, against the 
uh, locked against the shaft and then pinches into the blades that are going to be here. Now, um, yeah, so how, how does the assembly look like here? I think when we look at the details here, I don't think it's, after looking at it, I don't see how we are going to, let's close these other ones. So, it will be difficult to take this thing off. Like, say you take off the bearing. Well, the bearing could be put inside, and you can lift up the assembly. Like, okay, so let's say this bearing, if we put it inside, you would be able to take off the bearing and kind of like lift the shaft up. But it's a little difficult here. That shaft is sticking all the way in there. Like, you can't just take it out easily. Um, so I think what we have to do, we have to pull the shaft out. Well, but you can't with this square tube on it. So what you'd have to do is make this plate boltable on and off. So we'd want to extend this plate and put like two like one inch bolts into like a flange that would be... So right here we'd have to do something like a flange where we come off this. Like a two inch flange or something, something like this where you come off of that and actually bolt onto another flange that would be like right here you know do something like this where we'll bolt through these together and then take off that front plate because it's it would be otherwise really hard to take off the shaft I mean, you can't because the square is welded, you can't just pull it out. So somewhere, like one side of the box has to come off. I don't see any other way where we can do this. And, and this stuff here, there'll be, you know, that's next to the motor, so it's not easy to take off. But so for service, we take off this front plate, we lift the bearing, and then the shaft comes out. And how easy would it be to take the shaft out? Well, there's only this on a coupler. On a coupler here, all we have to do is take out this three-quarter bolt and the shaft will come out through the bearings. Um, so you got just this little bit that you can pull out through the bearings, probably loosen the bearing uh, and then can pull this out so you can switch out the rotor. Um, now the, all the blades on the square tube will be just the loose fit. They're just there. You can replace them like if we want to try. Uh, say we're doing the, the half inch blades for heavy duty we can maybe try like if you actually want you know you're doing smaller plastic you can get away with say like quarter inch blades and you have so many more bites per like it'll be the rate should probably like double for the kind of throughput you're getting so you can uh, do different interchangeable blades here but you just slide them on now, for which reason this collar here so that's that's going to be the equivalent to this green one here uh, another collar just like that that will come off through a screw through a, a set bolt on the shaft uh, so that you can pull that out and then slip on all your blades. So as we load all the blades up, you have one of the these collars. This collar will be off. We're slipping on all the blades. Uh, when all the blades are slipped on, we will tighten down those bolts that are in the, the four bolts that are in the blade clamp downs. Uh, the only other option that I could think of here, like, actually this forces you to use this whole shaft right now. So another way to do this here would be instead of clamping against the actual shaft, which is right there, we can make this assembly, but actually clamp it around the square tube. Now that's harder to make because this precision 3-inch tubing, we have that and we can cut that off and we can make that and put a set screw in it. But if you wanted to make this assembly, the, the blade clamp down and mount it on the square tube, you'd have to cut out, you'd have to basically do a whole weldment where you do a tube, basically a square tube around this square tube here. Uh, doable. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, um, but then you can basically slide that in and out to... to to, to, to accommodate as many blades as you like, and it's probably preferable.
because we probably don't want to make like all the blades and then then run and maybe make a few blades um so that's a consideration to decide on like what's do we want to like go around this shaft uh, both are doable the, the around the square shaft it's a little more fabrication but it's got more utility because you can then vary uh, vary the thickness basically the overall zone of your blades which is a good convenient feature i mean um that is nice and with this here you it's easier to make but in terms of prototyping it, it's kind of like that would be maybe more like the final design where you know you got all these blades already uh, so yeah either either is good and just looking at like say we were to build this like want to start cutting steel and getting cut lists like well is this good like are things fitting well the lens should be actually quite accurate here uh, the shaft goes all the way and the bearing it should be pretty much to maybe like within an eighth of the actual height of the bearing so that that shaft goes almost right up to the end of it uh, which is good now how does is there any provision here for how actually one thing we haven't set is how do you set the shaft fix it within the bearings themselves well we actually haven't done that we would need a set screw or collar like we have uh, we have two types of bearings there the four that we have one has these eccentric collars that you lock on to lock onto the shaft another one style has just a set screw so we've got both of those but actually uh, thinking about that point that shaft needs to stick out just a little more in order for the set screw to grab or for the collar to be put on because it's just ending a little too early we want this to stick out uh, so basically the bearing uh, <clears throat> bearing would have to be like maybe a little further in and that shaft would have to be sticking out so I have to move this here because uh, if there's a collar around it yeah you need some meat of the shaft sticking out of the bearing uh, so that so we might need to actually we need to close the, the dimensions of the box in to make the step the, the shaft uh, stick out I just moved it like 1.3 inches there um, so maybe we just need to clean up a couple of dimensions here now as far as uh, if we use these kinds of collars here um, the consideration there is you got to be able to get your bolts in there uh, so that's here we, we've got like not a lot we got like about 1.5 inch of space or so like uh, what is that not even it's like an inch of space there that so that's getting a little tight this we might want to just put that and the system we have here, maybe shorten up the tube. We got 20 inches right now. Should probably just go to 16 or something. Give us like two more inches on each side, so it's easy to get those bolts in and out. We're just shortening the overall length, but that's fine. I mean, 16 inches. I mean, that's still uh, quite a bit. Uh, so probably, probably make this like 16. Now, if we put the the blade clamp downs on actual square tube. We could actually use the 20 inches here because that's that's this distance here is two inches so the the clamp down that will be mounted on the square tube would actually work um, without having to shorten this tube here so that's just another consideration there um, I wonder though if we create like that extra space inside of the box for the blade you know outside of the, uh, the blade yeah it's a dead space it's not not great because uh, stuff will just collect there over time but I mean um, so it kind of be like this it'll be dead space where stuff collects so it's not not great so I think the minimum I've got like I think yeah I do like the adjustability of having the clamp downs on the two but then it does create more like two extra inches of dead space on the other side right, right. So, which would you suggest in this case? Yeah, I mean, the, the position that they're in now, with uh, shortening the tube just a little bit, it makes mm -hmm. for the bolts, so it's going to minimize the, the head space. So it makes yeah. the, the yeah. whole apparatus more usable. Mm -hmm. um, but then the trade-off, like you said, is that we have to fill the whole, you know, um, yeah. tube with weights. The other, 
Other, other week. week. Yeah. 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 Jeff said do a bunch of spacers. Um, or if we've got these same clamp down on this side here, we can actually use threaded rod and have like these long, very long push rods clamping everything down. Still doable. Um, so yeah, we could actually do that. I mean, we've got plenty of threaded rod like that. So yeah, yeah, this is uh, this is easier, more elegant to. I mean, easier to fabricate and all that um, yeah and, and do give it like extra two inches so we're not fighting trying to get those bolts in there um, so probably reduce this right like right now it's 20 reduce it probably to 16 and that way everything would fit and here uh, I shortened the, the box by 1.3 inches um, Uh, 30, 1.3, um, that, that draws it shortened by 2 inches exactly, so if we took that dimension before it was 26, that would actually make the box exactly 24 long, um, and you'd have enough space for the collar here and all that, uh, so probably do something of this effect. Um, yeah, and then the second rotor, pretty much just identical to this, and then there's the blades that aren't drawn. Uh, what else is here? So, well, here the, this motor should actually be uh, pointing upwards. That's the the fittings are in this square part here, so it actually has to uh, turned up here. Um, so a couple questions just to make sure I'm clear. So on the so the blade end clamps here on the uh, that three inch piece, and we need to put set screws into that as well to so lock that into the okay. Yeah. So we're gonna have set screws and then we'll have the bolts in the Yeah, the set screws. I mean, set screws. The easy way to do them, unless you're threading like a three quarter inch hole through steel, the easy way to do it is just weld on nuts. Um, we're not really set up to, we can't really do three quarter inch threaded holes uh, right now. Um, but yeah, just welding the nuts would, would do it, so that's a nice weldment. Um, the tube here would have two holes at like a, like a 60 degree angle. Um, let's see, um, there, there's like a little bit of science actually to the set screws. Um, Set, set screw angle if you google that I'll tell you like <clears throat> yeah I just gotta follow like I think it's like 45 a lot of times they got them it's not opposite and why is it not opposite because opposite would tend to like egg it out it's actually a little weaker if you analyze the forces so it's like this 45 yeah I've seen like 45 or 60 degrees it's it's uh, it actually gets you a hold a stronger hold so let's do just, I think 45 is fine here. Um, and you can take a look at the pattern, like uh, some of these couplers. Well, just take a look at any coupler, what, what angle they're at. Um, so, yeah. So then the other question that I had was, when you talk about the, uh, uh, the four holes on the, the, the motor and uh, sort of mounting, sort of fixing it in place, I'm trying to imagine what exactly that's going to look like. Like how exactly is that? Yeah, so I would do, what I would do here is you take this side here. I would do a weldment here to, to here. So you got another plate, a half inch steel that extends all the way here on both sides. So we can do this side here and now you can put your cross plate here so now you got a place to mount your motor Yep. Uh, see, I wasn't sure if we were gonna put a big hole plus the four 
four bolt holes. Yeah, and that would be a good. That's that's solid. That's pretty good, and you don't have to worry about like uh, attaching this to the table or anything like that. Here, I mean, <clears throat> yeah, we could just weld it or bolt it. Um, this is uh, the torque on this motor. It's it's like 300 kilogram meters. That's a lot. That's like one meter. It's like 300 kilograms. So it, like a few inches. It's 15,000 inch pounds um, per motor. So you got quite a torque on and this thing. In fact, yeah. So this kind of box here. Yeah. I mean, there's there's a lot of force on you. You need to enclose this pretty solid like this at least, so this doesn't torque up. Um, we might even have to weld some reinforcements, like maybe like a bar on top here and there to make it like an angle shape or like or like at the bottom. I mean, this would have a cover at the top, so just cover that so you can get your hands in there. Um, but when we actually run this, we might see this thing kind of like bending a little bit because steel, when it's flat, it bends. It still bends quite a bit. So, yeah, we could do something like <clears throat> way to fix stuff like this. It's like either like a straight bar here, like a two inch, and therefore it's, it's you got this equivalent of angle, like two inch, or like you know a bar across that would stabilize that too. Um, yeah, different ways to do it, but but yeah, something like a couple inch bar or like a bar across this. Yeah, or even like a like a flat sheet across the whole top. But you want to keep this exposed so you can service this. It'll be like a openable latch there. Um, and and how does the motor mount then? So you've got if you got the motor, you yeah. So so there's a procedure there. Like before we get oh, what's going on there? What is that? Oh, okay, that's that. That's the original. Okay, so the motor it's got this thick part. Uh, you see that that thick part there after the the bolts, and then there's the shaft. Um, but when we mount the motor, you got to do that without this big big ring because it, it won't fit otherwise. So we mount the motor, like take off this ring, and then mount this ring, the basically a double chain coupler. So that then this whole assembly, this plus the motor is in, and then we'll stick in the shaft from the other side. Uh, so put the bearing on, stick in the shaft through that. Kind of have to thread first like this thread. I mean, we'll put this on first. Oh, yeah, yeah. So so this tube is welded to the shaft, so this thing has to come in from... It can only go in from the right side here. And then we stick it in through the bearing and, and then lock down that bolt, the, the big bolt in the coupler. So. That's that's pretty much that. So I guess the only change here, if we use the system here, we get ourselves two extra inches by reducing this tube four inches, and therefore we have enough space for the collar or set screws on the bearing here. Um, so this side instead of 26 would be 24 or so. And then um, the blades are it's like a like an inch of space around the outside. So I think this is 17 on the inside there. So eight. Uh, let's see what we got there. That distance is 17 to the inside of the box, so the box is 18 inches on the outside. Mm -hmm. So. Okay, so that makes sense to put them together. Now in my mind, I'm trying to get the disassembly procedure, like yep. the servicing. Because mm -hmm. okay. over by the motor, there's that one rod you got to take out so the whole thing can slide in and out. But then I'm, oh yeah, yeah. okay, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. So then that left hand has to come off completely. Yeah, so okay, yeah. to disassemble it, the bearing comes out. Uh, uh, remove this remove bolt, you can pull the rotor out, no, but you have to... Well, I'll take off that plate there, this plate, which is going to be like this here. So, so that plate's going to have like two big bolts, like one inch bolts or something. Um, get like nice big bolts in there. Yeah, so that'll be 
something like that something like that um, right so and the, the way we have it here the blades are overlapping here so now, now the blade detail comes about um, uh, how much are they overlapping this ring here is I think that's eight inches across Eight inch across, so but that's uh, as far as the structure. I think this is good. The only thing that um, there's details about the spacing of exactly where how how tight the two shafts are going to be together. The limit is the bearings. You put the bearings right next to each other, or we can actually trim the bearings, like literally cut them off. Um, so yeah, so if you look at this um, angle, actually, let's let's play with this bearing here. Like, can we actually rotate this and get a better? So here's the. Let's rotate this bearing. <clears throat> so if we rotate it to 45. <clears throat> Does that help us mount anything better? Like, because we can put the bearings like this as well uh, if we wanted to put the bearings a little closer to like we could actually cut off let's see what's going on there oh yeah this one this is if you wanted to cut the edge of the bearing off and actually get them a little closer to each other so you've got three bolt holes that are still holding the bearings but does this even hit the box? No, it's it's above the box, so that wouldn't work. So I guess another thing that you could do is you made it more like like six to thirty, and then they can slide up there against each other. You know, so instead of having such an extreme angle, what am I trying to say? You see what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. So they they can slide in a little bit more. Yeah, possibly. Like if we wanted to get, because <clears throat> the consideration there was we're working with the eight-inch stock steel for the the blades, but uh, as we said, the the eight-inch squares have the corners are actually further out. They're like eight times diagonally across. You've got how much? It's one about 1.4 times times eight. I mean, you got actually 11 across. It's like 5.5 inches. Um, so there is significant overlap if you take the square blade and and design it such that. Okay, so here we'd go to blade design 101. Um, but you start with. Yeah, so the edge of the blades can't be past the eight-inch top of the box. I mean, I mean, they can. Yeah, they can. Then we'd have to um, consider that as, as far as how we close the box. I mean, there's going to be a hopper on top, and underneath we're going to have the mesh. But the idea is what's, I mean, is there, do we want to actually trim down the bearings so we have more overlap? Do we want to use a blade design that's like kind of what I was drawn before, which was, which if you have this, that's your blade, that's that's the plate you start with, what do you want to do? Like you can do something like, I mean you can do something like, here's your, <clears throat> you know, like your, you're cutting this out like this, and then you're cutting this out like this and and 
that's your you know your blade you can do this if you want but you only got four teeth that bite at the highest level um, You can do a blade that looks like this if you want, and those, oh, that, there's a tooth missing there. Um, you could do that. Uh, you can have like more teeth, you can draw like more teeth here. These teeth will be like overlapping like quite a bit. Um, we could do something like that, I mean that's... Because uh, if you get more teeth in here, you want more teeth for more bites per, per circle, per cycle. Um, so if you draw, draw in another teeth, that those teeth will be like still you can they could catch plastic like whatever falls in there too. So it's like you can get like an eight tooth blade out of this kind of system where the outer blades are like sticking out more, the inner blades are a little, you know. It's kind of weird. I've never seen it like this, but if you got this kind of stock stock material, it does kind of make sense. Or we just, as I mentioned before yesterday, we just go and get the flat sheet metal, the big sheets. Uh, once again, we talked about that's difficult to carry, but yeah, we can torch out a slice of three by four feet. We can cut larger blades that are not like not out of the eight-inch wide stock, like here. So the only thing that worried me about that, and I think as you were explaining yesterday, it does seem like we could fix it in the G code, but you know because of the I guess the, the Z-axis leveling effect, the, uh, the 3D printer head tends to, to jump from position to position instead of just doing a straight outline. So I'd be worried that if it was coaching, it would jump to a different position in the perimeter and just like leave like a horizontal line across, <laughs> you know, the blade when it's jumping from one edge to another. You see what I'm saying? Does that make sense? No, what are you, you saying? Know, so sometimes, like, uh, so one of the first prints, you know, we do, like, the, the two squares, right? We just do yeah. two squares. And because, uh, because of the, the Z leveling on the bed, right, it doesn't, sometimes it'll jump from one edge of a perimeter on one square and it'll come over to another one here. Yeah. This way, right? And if it jumps back and trying to, to make sure that everything is level as it's moving. Right? And if we're just working with something that's planar, maybe we won't have that issue, but I'm worried that if we had sort of a long strip of metal and we had a number of different blades we were trying to cut out all next to each other, that at some point the torch would jump from one position to another mm -hmm. with the cutting still on and just wind up with like a slice or an indentation across the surface. Well, that's an, yeah. Going to another, right? Well, yeah, that's an issue that, that exists no matter what. I mean, the code better be right. That's why we run it dry first. and. Yeah, stuff like that. Make sure we know that the pattern that we think we're cutting are actually are. Yeah, I mean, that would be great if, it, you know, if it's just doing perimeter, essentially, and it stops at one point and then starts cutting the perimeter. You're saying for safety, just do like one at a time? Is that what you're suggesting? Even, yeah, even if they're yeah. in sequence. Or oh, yeah. yeah. Just so it doesn't yeah. start over here and then jump over to this corner of the blade and start from a different direction and remind it to see Yeah, that's, that's kind of like the sequencing of like, we'd want to start like, when we do this, we just want to start with a little plate and see if we can do that first. That's um, so that means we get like all the end stops correct and and like this piece of metal like registered against. You know, we have markings on the table for what zero is and stuff like that, so we know that we're hitting it and yeah, just a bunch of alignment issues uh, to make sure we shake that down. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, in this, let's see, this in this blade. It's 
some point, I feel like I'm going to develop more precise language for talking about all of this, and that's going to be helpful. <laughs> yeah. That kind of blade is something that's possible. Um, well, with more more teeth on the side here too. Um, yeah, we can play with this, but uh, I think yeah, I think the we definitely want to do some simple. Um, I, I'd say from the eight-inch stock, it definitely saves us like carrying the big metal and, and like cutting it. We have to cut it, you know, the torch first to, to make it usable. So. Um, so, regarding what's possible for us to act on right now, yeah, there's plenty, plenty of stuff here, like, okay, so there's the, the structure, yeah, there's the tube, uh, so you can get a cut list, so there's tube, there's these uh, blade clamp downs, as far as all this, these plates, and then you gotta do the holes through them with the bolt pattern of the of the bearings. Um, I noticed that uh, actually the bearings, we got to be a little careful on that one. We should take the bearings and actually like transfer punch holes through them. The three bearings are identical. The, there's there's ones that have the collars and ones that have the set screw and actually their whole pattern is like slightly off. It's like a quarter inch off. So you actually got to pay attention to that that because um, the ba bearings are not completely uniform with their spacing. They are both like eight inches but the bolt spacing so just maybe transfer punch that to to get the right spacing and then the inner hole that could be pretty pretty large it's for three inch shaft make it like four inches or whatever um yeah th so this whole assembly from the the motor to i mean up to the shaft i mean we actually i mean we have all of that already so it's it's about getting the box getting the tube getting the the blade clamp downs and all the holes on that uh, and then getting the the pieces that support the motor um, the here um, yeah I think that's the easiest way to do it right here uh, easiest I mean iron worker to shear the slabs that's, that's the easiest uh, for this flange yeah just do this extended piece and then do like a half by two the holes, yeah. Mm -hmm. So there's a little cut list to generate and get out there. On this, the other side? No, on what's now the bottom of the screen, the left side. This one? Yeah, to remove that. Why don't we need the bolts on both sides? Because that that bottom. Yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, I didn't draw that. It's. Uh, Okay, just making sure I'm visualizing everything. Yeah, let's maybe do that. So you got your second thing. Of, yeah, I just didn't draw it. Just so you got your flange on the other side too. through that um, like a little space there like a quarter inch or like an eighth inch space is good so that when you clamp down you're actually pulling this so this is one piece that's one long piece these are not like welded on that's one long piece um, so that's pulling against this edge here yeah just uh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Making sure the bearings are attached to the shaft by the set screws or collars. Uh, this thing is welded, so that's a big weld job there. That would be 16 inch. Yeah. Now the then the mesh structure. So as far as what's it stand on, I think just a simple like a rebar frame thing. Just make sure it's stable. Uh, probably. 
Yeah. Yeah. And just if this is this like, is like say, say twenty say inches across, across, make it like three feet or so. I just a box that sticks out. A bigger box for um, like a table structure. Uh, this where it st sits on here. If the blades, if the blade edges are sticking out. Well, the profile of the screen that goes underneath it, we didn't draw that in here, but that, that's something we would um, retrofit. It's a thing that I guess this would uh, sit on as far as the little mesh structure. Um, yeah, we didn't draw that detail, but that's. Uh, I don't think we need to do that at this point. It would be. Um, it's probably like, probably like another, another small, small box, box underneath that holds the screen. So it'd be so this would basically sit, sit on this part, this, part, this large box large here. here. Well, this this shredder this box, box would sit on another part, which holds the mesh. Uh, what's mesh? Like what's screen for? You guys know what I'm talking about for screen? Yeah. Yeah. And it's curved. Uh, it's like that because it goes against the blades. It's it's kind of curved like that. Images. Um, yeah, like if you've got a shredder, you know the bottom. Yeah. The blades kind of go close to it. Um, if you can picture that, yeah. Uh, we have to kind of weld up a holding structure for it. It's basically like these two curved pieces, like that. So we take the mesh and just bend it around. Um, yeah. That's that we can do a little later. Yep. So then the box that this whole thing is sitting on should it have. Sort of a two component for the structure, like similar lengths, so that the uh, the motor assembly has got something sort of rigid to sit on. You know. Well, this uh, with the happen steel here, this uh, like the box going from here. What I would do is probably do, do like a quarter inch box, like on the bottom. So it's so like a small, maybe like. Probably like three inch tall. So let's draw this box here. So thinner, like we don't need structure there. It's just for the to hold the screen. So it'll be like say like quarter inch, probably like three inch tall or something like that. So you got this extension now here. Yeah. That which will hold hold the screen. Um, so actually, this shape here, uh, what it would look like, it would actually be. So you're kind of like following the. So it'll be a curved shape, kind of like follows the follows the blades. Something like that. Um, yeah. Um, kind of rough drawing, but but the screen would kind of like fit around that. <clears throat> See what I'm saying? Uh, just bend the screen around. So we might have to have like. Like as far as these parts, these uh, curves, like maybe four of them, like every, you know, every eight inches, every nine inches, like put one of those holders so, so that the screen fits around that and it's held securely. Because um, if you got plastic pushing against it, you want to hold that screen so it doesn't just like, uh, like bend out of the way. So, so that screen will probably be welded to this. Um, to the let's say this quarter inch steel um, 
Yeah, something like that. But that that could be like I would make that a separate piece. Let's not. It doesn't have to be structural like the frame. The frame is very strong. It's half an inch. But the the screen holder on the bottom, we could probably just uh, take the screen holder. It'll be enough structure so you can hold the weight of the shredder, but it's not holding the forces of the shredder. So it's just holding the weight, which is a few hundred pounds, as opposed to the structure on top, which is holding thousands of pounds of force. So, yeah. Yeah, so something like, like that here. Um, From here we can get, get into like cut list for the main main box and everything else. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so update on. Let's do a little update on torch. Where are you at? Uh, the Z axis is uh, just putting on the belt now. Uh, and then uh, I'll put the end stops on as well. And then uh, yesterday I did uh, run the uh, the X axis. That's running. Okay. I'm just wondering. Um, no, no worries. No, Andre, no. you're perfect. Yeah. 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 Um, and then, and then uh, once the Z axis is checked, then we can start re remodeling the um, all the electronics layout. Mm -hmm. yeah. So with um, the spacing, spacing between the two X axes, yeah. uh, you didn't do. You're still putting together the Z, or do you have the mounts, the mount pieces? No, it's already it's already on. I'm just I'm fitting the belt. Yeah. Okay. Actually, I did, the did you end up using using those half printed? Yes, I did. Yeah. So the purple so ones you used exactly that. Yeah. Yeah, I used the um, the half pieces. Yeah. Mm hmm. Any comments on that? Is that so? You had to, t you did this, you drilled it off the structure. So was it hard to align it and make sure everything fits? Uh, the only thing I'm worried or I'm a bit worried about is how how stiff does it have to be? How stiff does the Z axis carry have to be against the X axis? Because because it's a bit of movement. Okay, you want it to be stiff. What you probably want, might want to do is uh, either get one side tight, so you got both, so you got clamp force against this, so you'll be stiff on one side. And then there's a, if there's a gap on the other, you put a spacer in there or something. Because uh, right now we don't have any adjustment for how parallel the two X's are, right? So you could. Actually, I, I would say the best strategy is get one side really stiff, and the other side, uh, yes, it's located, but it's not clamped down fully. It's located so it can't move, like, in the X direction, but it's not pinched down hard so that you might get into jamming of the actual axis, right? Uh, and how do you do that with a bolt that's in, so it's locating the Z, but it's not screwed down tightly, so it can still move, move in and out, uh, like a bushing, like a. Does that make sense? Well, uh, I mean, at the moment, uh, the X Let's take a look at it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the important part, and and the important part is like, do you see any like when you stop and reverse direction? Do you see wobbling? If you do, like that's not good. We should look at get could be stiffened up. Um, I mean, 
yeah i mean we might have to look at the connection i mean that's you know that's these two points of connection you want to have it separated as far as you can by the six inches that you have available you want it to be tight uh, as far as whatever is bolting in there that's pretty tight and if that one side is tight uh, it wants to be it should be pretty good uh, then the only other things we can play with is um, yeah I mean uh, I don't know what uh, the only thing is we can make these plates larger like in terms of height so you stabilize the Z more but yeah let's take a look at it see what we've got there um, but yeah, I, I mean, we got to work out like, the good details of how you make everything really tight against each other. and Because the other thing you could do is, I mean, you can put a plate on the second side of this Z. You, know, you can make this whole sandwich. Um, just just more meat, more maybe more metal, more... An angle. An angle. Maybe. Angle? Between the... Like here? Like put a piece of angle and just bolt them together really tight? Yeah. Exactly. That could be it. Um, yeah. But I mean, I haven't noticed anything. I mean, yeah, when you, you see. run the x-axis, it moves okay. Yeah, let's take a look at it, see, um, see what we got there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I mean, these little pieces here, are they're tiny little mount pieces. Um, you think they're like fragile or? Uh, it flexes a bit. Mm -hmm. If you move the carriages in opposite direction, it does flex a bit. Yeah. But then uh, when the carriages are moving... In opposite directions, you mean uh, that's no, intentionally no, or by mistake? Just physically, just... But I mean, when you, when you, when you actually... Um, move axes uh, electrically it moves okay I mean, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah 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 okay the thing is there so I mean it's a consideration of speed like if you're going slowly on a torch like cutting it half inch or one inch steel it's probably not a problem but if you're cutting like eighth inch or quarter inch or you want to go much faster uh, you're gonna get your quality control issues upon any kind of turn if you're wobbling the head so this wants to be really stiff yeah 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 um yeah so we'll, we'll take a look at that but like we should get some figures of merit like like for example like say 20 inches per minute which is speed for half inch steel then maybe quadruple that to like say 80 or 100 inches per minute for like say uh the eighth inch steel i could just take a data point like okay how much visible wobble do we see? Um, they'll, yeah, we, we, can, we can quantify some of these things if you want to. Um, we should in a full product release that is forthcoming ASAP. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, all this, the data points of, yeah, including the backlash and forces and all that, that 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 would be in our specs of the table this is like okay this is the performance it could get yeah all right uh so so mount the continue working on the z-axis and then you'd probably be ready to remount the electronics configuration and then we, we get the whole thing going um if you have Right now, there's right only now there's two drivers, or, or are you driving the third? The third one's not on there, right? The, uh, I've, I've put it on, but I uh, haven't yet wired it. You want to do that before switching to the reconfiguration? Yeah, just to check. The you should check it, check and we should check like some. Um, what's worth checking at that point? Um, do you want to actually use that um, and try some cuts or not yet? Uh, not, not yet. Um, just like to uh, do the redesign here. To make it all convenient and easy to manage. I know this is a good idea. 
Um, and that shouldn't be long. I mean, that's that's uh, you got the control panel that I saw there. That's from the other machine, so it's yeah. not not too bad. You've got all the parts. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Sounds good. Keep working on that. Uh, any issues on like as far as how the motors uh, on the x-axis are mounted like the little blocks which are not drawn here that's those are working to ho hold everything yeah hold the yeah. belt tight okay that's good mm -hmm. cool um, All right. So, how about progress on the filament maker there? Yeah. Um, I yeah. I, don't, I I made it run yesterday. Uh, the drying out of the plastic might make a, slight, a slight difference in the quality of the filament coming out, uh, but by no means perfect. But I don't think I don't think it's possible to use in the current configuration. So the, the horizontal positioning just makes it ooze out. So say I'm 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 feeding filament out of it, I'm taking that piece, I'm trying to, to fit it to the spool. In that meantime I got like three meters on the floor. Just oozing out. With no rubber on right. Um and I ran it, uh, the temperature was really out of even yesterday. I actually did it to like two hundred 45 to 260 on the lower, which should be like a good working point. Uh, but it's just so hard. Like there's there's the feed rate of the auger, and there's the feed rate affected by the temperature of the plastic. There's the feed rate of the, the spool winder. And to make all that match, it's just, I just end up with a bunch of plastic at the bottom. And yesterday, uh, eventually the, ro the auger just got stuck. So I kill the heating, I try to make the rotor go, but the stuck, stuck. So I'm gonna empty it out, see what it looks like inside. But if it's if it has the same black caramelized plastic on the inside, that's just like well. And I ran it for 20 minutes. So it's really hard to use. So I just, uh, well, I need to open up and just assess what the hell happened with it yesterday. But I'd say it needs to be mounted, yeah, horizontally rather than vertically, so to be able to control the feed rate reliably. Mm -hmm. um, can we start that by twisting like you want it 90 degrees or? Because I mean, that would be a rework of the. Uh, Whole system, right? Or yeah, I mean, yeah. I kind of have to remount. How how much effort is that to to actually remount it? We can make it. Um, how easy is it to shift it to the ninety degrees as opposed to vertical? I take the whole thing down, and I saw it off the wings of it, and make sure I just had the square chamber where the motors attach, and the plastic thing like that. I get that piece saw off the sides, the wings of the chamber, of the container. Uh, get that mounted 90 degrees or whatever angle will work, uh, and then I would just need some sort of canister to put above to feed it down. So the auger sticks out enough, so it should be possible to feed it on the top. I believe. P probably 3D print some funnels or something. Yeah, I mean, yeah. literally, if you take what we have right now, uh, what happens if you're just, to, I mean, you can't load it at that point the same way, but what if you just turn the whole thing 90 degrees and then put in a hole at the top so you can actually feed it? Oh, that's what I'm suggesting. Yeah. All right. I think that's the... Just basically use what we have and, and just uh, add yeah. a feeding mechanism that will allow that to be fed. Yeah. Yeah. And maybe try with another material. Yeah, so we have. We hard ourselves trying to do with PC. 
probably it's probably probably hard because of the high temperature. We've got the TPU that we could try. Yeah. Maybe that would be. Um, um, but it's just really, really, really hard to connect the phone with the system between those two machines. There's, there's nothing stopping the material just to grow up. I could try to capture it so the gravity is not affecting it as much, but then being able to feed it to the, the, the meanwhile without making kinks that then go through all the way. Uh, does the second person help any on that, or is it just too fast? I'll need a second person to get it down, if, I, if I'm reworking the configuration, the structure. Otherwise, yeah, I don't know. Probably not. This be working. Maybe ask Wes to make a quick recat or something. And then, um, as far as the cooling, that doesn't address the flow, the ooze, like if you cooled it more coming out, would that help any or? It, it would if we had a steady good feed rate, but as it is now, enough material, whether it's cold or not, drops down and starts cooling the material down. So as soon as you have this thing, it just speeds up, speeds up, speeds up. And you uh, get really, really what about, uh, about going to the other thing we talked about, which is the screw that adjusts the feed rate, so you're not oozing out and you can actually control that. Yeah, I'm not sure where I should mount that. And I'm not sure how to make it where it's cold. Uh, the industry standard, the factory farm, drill through, weld on the nut, and that's yeah, a that's threaded hole. <laughs> we can take a coupler, like one way to implement what we have with what we have is you take a half inch coupler, uh, so drill a hole through it, weld a nut, and then you put a set, um, like a half inch, half inch nut, and then the set screw is like a half inch set screw, and you can screw it in all the way, and it has to be all wrapped up in the insulation. I'm just wondering, like, I mean the main constrictor is the size of the hole. So we get a bolt then that sort of matches the, I mean, half inch chamber inside of it, or empty space inside of it. What, yeah, I wonder, what, will it really affect, because say I constricted 75%, it's just screw pretty far in. Right? It will still be able to push enough material to the nozzle, full of earth, but more material to the nozzle than the nozzle is already oozing out. Well, it might slow down the bulk flow that's allowing the small nozzle to feed a lot of material in the first place. So, I mean, I can't, can't really predict exactly what's going to happen, but if you're stopping, like, there's this torrent, and you're stopping that torrent, it probably will affect how much is actually oozing out. Because it's the pressure, like, above that's, you know, kind of making it go down. So if you block off that pressure a bit, it might... That might do yeah, something, yeah. but I mean, I can't tell without doing it. It's a bit of a lavender flow in a sense, I guess, with, with, with the filament coming out actually cooling the plastic. Other thing that the precious plastic guys did, they put a little screen, they put a little mesh like within a tube so it breaks, uh, it weakens the force of the thing just falling down. It's just basically a block. It's like a pressure reducer yeah. just going through material. I mean that's gets tricky because you have to get that in there. Um, yeah, and whenever might. yeah, and then if you have temperature invariance you need to open and clean it out. Um so, uh, yeah it's really frustrating. Yeah, um, what are your thoughts on that? So, like the restrictor, does that sound like a good idea or? 
technically too difficult to implement? Like, what's your what's your thought on it? Sounds like the restrictor is in the panel. Right? Yeah, it's yeah. bolt through a bolt through a pipe, basically. So you're just clamping down the the aperture. The opening just gets blocked off. So I mean, you got to sit there and watch it and make adjustments while the process is. Yeah, yeah, the issue was starting to get the filament spooler fed so if you just reduce that at that point and then when you just open it up more or less yeah. depending on how you know you want that you want to give yourself some time to actually feed it I think I think I'd rather my intuition tells me that I'd rather spend the time making it horizontal because that actually addresses the, the oozing out as well mm -hmm. um, <coughs> the one thing about putting a nut in is, is how tight it will be and what, what the possibility of hot plastic moving out of the sides is. Because that oh, yes. gets everywhere. There's issues it, like that, yeah. Um, yeah. That's true, there's an issue of then that's a leak point. Mm -hmm. Ideally, I would like to have like one uniform metal tube that fits the heating elements perfectly above on top of them so the heat, whatever heat goes into it disperses immediately and then maybe make like a an invitation into the metal rod like a place the, the thermometer and set it because um, I think that stage one is to have absolute control of the amount of power and what's the heating elements Yesterday it was acting worse than it was before. I did mount kill switches on them, that was the only difference. But that made it even harder because then I had to, besides these feed rates, I also had to take into account like where it was the temperature at and it's coming down. And it's pretty cold out there too, That's that's uh, makes it a little harder because you got all this heat loss too. And it's like freezing weather almost. Yeah, yeah. but it definitely gets hotter than it yeah. should be. Uh, I mean, the temperature readings are above set temperature. Can you check in with Wes about the algorithm, like why it's coming on and no, should but probably I know not? No, it works. It's just supposed to. Oh, that's one of the. It's just supposed to turn off what it's about and turn off turn on what it's on. That's it. But that's I, not I, happening I, though, I, right? I, I, I thought about one thing. So, so you and me noticed that even though the temperature was above, you can still see the SSR the relays getting clicked on and off. Right. And one reason for that could be that if the thermistor's data to the, the the board has a higher refresh rate than the display, there might be like momentary moments when the they, they release the temperature low and then turns it on and turns it off, but it never registers on the display. Um, that could be one reason. Mm -hmm. Maybe the envelope needs to be relaxed, so you don't have too much control action. What I mean? The, uh, the temperature that it turns on and off creates an envelope, right? I mean, it's kind of standing inside of the envelope. Yeah. So maybe if you relax it a little bit, you won't have as much control action. I guess it depends on the Well, it's, it's a binary thing. Keep it over temperature or under temperature. Oh, okay. So it's not taking into account so the acceleration yeah, yeah, yeah. up to the temperature or the deceleration or the temperature. Cool. Um, I'm just saying if, you, if you're getting a, a lot of switching, then I'd say can you relax that temperature on but the breeze and take the lower threshold down to the threshold down and then still there's no threshold. This is a binary thing, it's either above or below under or under. So there's only one temperature. One. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that's the, that's what we want to do. We wanna have a uniform temperature at the bottom to wherever yeah, work. There's got to be two. It can't go infinitely in one direction. It can't go to zero and it can't go to 700. Right? We set it at 240. And the thermistor is going to heat up until the thermistor is above 240. And at that moment, it turns off the heat. And then whenever it goes below, it turns it on again. Yeah. Whenever it goes below 240. Yeah. yeah, so I guess I'm saying like maybe if you set a lower envelope at like 236 or something like that. So mm -hmm. it stays in the range. Then it wouldn't turn off every time it goes to the two thirty nine, right? It wouldn't. You wouldn't have to. It wouldn't be switching that. But 
I'm saying, can you make an envelope that's a little more relaxed and still gives you precise control so you have one to flip on and off as much? Um, you know, like, can you still get precise control from 242 to 213? So you put two values inside of the system. I can't handle that. You can't? No, no, no. It's a binary thing. It's only one value. Oh, but you could reprogram. That's what I'm saying. Oh, yeah. You know. Um, we could. Yeah. <laughs> or, uh, uh, um, you just relax the system a little bit and see if you still get what you need at. Because every time the temperature changes by one degree, your SSR is going to be Okay, you can probably go yeah, and work the ta work that, torch like table if you want. Put, you can go and work the torch table if you want, yeah, yeah, if it's not interesting. Yeah. 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 Work this out. Yesterday, didn't I, that. I don't know why, and it really, really ran off. Uh, and one of the issues with that is the separation between the emitter and the heating element. So what we have now is the machine and the setting of the fittings that leads down to the nozzle. Did you try more insulation around the whole structure? Yeah. Maybe, but there's there. It's a thin line to where the auger starts to really like struggle to make it through whenever it's too cold, and it's probably around 230 actually. Um, and what happened to the yesterday was it just it just got stuck. I let it go, it just go on, and then eventually it moved and then it stopped completely. And 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 the system started acting. Oh yeah, the, the system started acting really really weird because. I don't know if the PSU took a hit or something, but the whole system started creaking, and I couldn't figure out where that came from, what, what was trying to move, and the auger was turned off, absolutely. Still, this, the, the whole board and everything was creaking as if it was trying to adjust. And creaking, then, like a mechanical sound? Yeah, like the wood moving about, or like distorting, mm. as if it was putting force on it, but, but I wasn't, the auger was turned off. I mean, and, and what then hap what then happened is that uh, as the auger as the auger didn't turn around and the motor didn't move it, um, whenever I switched on the motor for the auger, the fan speed that I had mounted under the nozzle started running at a higher RPM. When I turned on the switch to keep more electricity from the motor, which is coming out of a 24 volt. Not even the same output as the heating fan, although the cooling fan. The cooling fan is start. Uh, That's uh, just a quick transient because you got when, when you flip the switch, then it goes real quick. So the fans are going to see just a higher voltage temporarily. That's not temporarily. It just broke. It just, it just stayed like that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Let's see. Uh, yeah. 
And uh, I'm, I'm sure of the, the condition of the motor, but it wasn't running it very much yesterday. And when I turned it on, it did like, kind of like try it, but not cool. I think the creaking is probably a temperature effect too, because there's a difference between hot and cold out there. So the wood is working. Yeah, that's probably, yeah, that's very possible, yeah. We're putting some really high temperatures on it, kicking it off, and it's in the end. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, I mean so the heating, the pipe and stuff. The heating elements are about a foot from the top plate and from the wood. And yeah. sure, heat charm is up there, but it, yeah, not very much. Of it. Maybe maybe the added insulation made more heat travel up there. So. I think the horizontal makes my eyes. You know, <laughs> but then this other process. This is honestly what I'm worried about. Because we found pretty much every machine we've done so far, right? 3D printers, even when we get them built, a significant amount of time to fine tune and adjust the operation before we can get quality prints, right? Mm -hmm. And the, uh, the filament maker, even when the machine is built, a significant amount of time in initializing and fine tuning the system before we get quality filament, right? Mm -hmm. CNC torch table. <laughs> yeah, it's easier to, uh, it's, it's easier to design, of course, but... No, I'm, I'm saying that that's still, in my mind, I still see a potential issue for getting the shredder done. Because even when we have the CNC torch table finished, I think there's still going to be a significant amount of time in initializing and fine-tuning the system before we can make quality movies. Yeah. Right. I feel like that's kind of the pattern that we've been seeing is that we get the build done, but then it still takes a lot to make it operational and yeah. operate at the level of quality that makes the end product useful. Well, I'd, I'd love to make this machine run on the, all the waste peeling we have. And it'd be really nice to get to get to the shredder and, and then sort of use our material to uh, see how that acts. Because hopefully it's just easier plastic to, to make it out of. Yeah. But yeah, my... my my intuition tells me that yeah, it definitely needs to be very horizontal placed. Uh, and that would take a lot of work, of course. So I think the way we're looking at it and trying to figure out a way to communicate this, right? But the heating elements, when you turn them on, they uh they have to warm up. When you turn them off, they have to cool down. And both of those processes are not linear, right? When they get to a stable operation, you put a certain amount of electricity in them, you get a predictable amount of warm up or cool down. Mm -hmm. right? They have like a, a linear range of operation. Most things do. It's a little non linear when you start it up, it goes into a linear range, and then it's non linear when you put it With our battery charging, it's the same way. When you first start to charge the battery, you put a lot of electricity in it, you get a little bit of charge. And that medium range is very predictable. But then the computer says you have 10% left in the past and you have to prove mm -hmm. right? So around the turn on and the turn off, you get to the number and you're the most of the time. So what, I guess what I'm suggesting is that once it's on and it's operating, it's easier to control the temperature change. But when you turn it off and you turn it back on, you get these non-linear effects, right? You have to worry about how quickly the heating element itself is cooling down when it turns off and how much residual heat is still in it the next time it turns back on, right? So you're not getting as precise control as you would think if the heating element keeps turning on and turning off. But if it's on and it's operating at a steady state, it's easier to move it up a degree, down a degree precisely and because it's in a linear mode of operation. And so it would be easier to keep it inside of a, an, an envelope for maybe four degrees or something like that if it stays on and if it keeps turning off and turning off and turning off and turning off. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think one of the complications is that there's two meters uh, and they affect each other on each other's meeting. So when the normal one is lagging the high, trying to heat up, a lot of that heat is just spread up into the into the trimester reading of, uh, above. Sometimes it works gallantly and sometimes it just doesn't want to equalize. That's the whole idea of three zones being effective because I know we were controlling them independently because the idea was maybe one will be cooler here and one will be hotter here. I'm not sure if you understand that it makes sense to just control the side of things. They are. Yeah. Well, 
well, the, or, the, the art and the art, they're, they're, con they're controlled by the same setting. There's only one temperature setting, I think, in both of them. But the board switches them on and off independently, whether or not they're up to that temperature. And that's, I guess, the way you would like to have it, since otherwise you risk having too much of a different temperature between them. Because otherwise you just be enough for one of them to be above, and then the one that's like 50 degrees below, and yeah, you have a big difference in the know. That makes sense. Um, and the linear, like the linear movement, like the heating element will rise with uh, 60 degrees in the first two minutes, and rise with 300 degrees in the next two minutes. Uh, and we will need like a efficient species to evaluate them to evaluate that. But however, what's this kind of that simple algorithm at least can stabilize whenever the temperatures are in the right sort of and about right. Like set to 240 and one is 245, another one is 239 in the state that But for some reason yesterday one of them went up to like 360 or something. Is the best thing right now to try for the, the horizontal con conflict then? I think so. I, th I think that's the, the most reasonable option. But, but I'm afraid that I'll be down there now. Uh, I'll inspect the tube and I'll realize I have to clean it all up like, yet again. And that issue has been more to do with the sort of interplay between the thermistor and the heating element. That has worked and needs to be off with the like, as I see, like the problem that needs to be solved to make this machine is just to have a very steady, steady and, and sort of manageable temperature to heat. Right. So is it that it just has excursions that go way up every so often? Is that the idea there? Uh, what it's usually is that when I turn the machine on and it starts to heat up, one of them will get way hotter than the other. Uh, and it will fail to cool down. So say we get a run off on the normal one to 320. On the top one is still moving up towards 240 and then it's at 220. So the lower one turns off and the top one heats, on, heats up. But the lower one is not really cooling off. It's not, a, it's not coming in from the, the band of heat like the, the temperature will warm. Is uh, what happened to the notion of just one heater element to simplify things? Did that ever work? Um, we did run it once. Yeah, um, that was really early. We did that, and uh, yeah, it's worth the te uh, testing. It. I mean, all I have to do is just disconnect. The issue with that might be that you have enough plastic that's below the liquid temperature and then it gets the auger stuck. The auger is freely moving close to the nozzle and the heat is hotter, more hot. Then it might be jamming about this. It. It's the only problem you think of it. One easy thing I think we could do is throw in another thermistor that just reads a global temperature somewhere and says if it ever crosses 300 or 310 or something like that, it just cuts everything off and it gives you like error. And so it's just over there, you know, right? so Yeah, but they are, they are off while reaching that temperature. It's not like it runs off past 240 and the relays stay on. Okay. Something like that. It would act differently with just heating element, with one heating element. One of them might turn on and then displace the heat to the other one that needs to stay at a, a, a high temperature. But we, we're not having one of because the system is not turning on. It is. What's probably happening is that it's a long while the heating element. The heating element might reach 450 degrees. And then 
to chew this 160. And at that point, I just have to turn it off. Wait three, four minutes. It will equalize. And when it has equalized and the temperature up to two, it reaches 140, then it can send the signal to turn it off. Do we have fans that we can put across the room to, to cool them off? No, we insulate them rather to make all that heat radiate towards the tube. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I'm, I'm saying in the thermal runaway situation, if you want to cool it, if you want to cool it quickly to get it back into so, the well, then the insulation is going to keep it from going down. You have to force the air down through the tube to cool the tube. Yeah. How about two-stage heating, like where we start with, say, much lower than whatever we got, like 240, like maybe 180, and wait for it to stabilize, and then when that stabilizes, take it up yeah, that might be a gradually, like, okay, so take it down to 200, do we get stabilized? And you, you, know, you can walk away and watch it, it should stay there. Like, yeah. if we can't get to that, I mean, then we don't have control over the systems, so we got to get to that level. Yeah. And maybe it just takes, takes a really long time to do it, like an hour or something. Um, I mean, it has acted well, like, it has been able to move mm -hmm. to a stable to a point. Mm -hmm. But yeah, that's, that, that's absolutely, absolutely one way to test it. One of the issues is, if it's heating up towards the temperature, it takes five minutes for the thermistor to get triggered. The last two minutes before it gets triggered, heating elements are, are outputting a lot, a lot of heat that mm -hmm. it eventually overheat. Yeah. So yeah, bring it at a lower temperature so that the whole thing turns off for and gradually stepping it up. Yeah, that's that could be uh, So what would those values be started at at what? Uh yeah, at home one it would be a good temperature to set it Because at that point it has to you know, that's maybe even lower, but like hundred fifty or sixty or something. At a certain point, the heat, the heat just starts to, yeah, the amount of heat getting fed to the tube accelerates heavily like in the last stage of the tube. So to make the turn off earlier and have a right. temperature. Because there's so much thermal mass there, you got all this tube, you got that plate connected to it, it kind of ramps all up and then once it's nice and warm, yeah, the heat just keeps going. There's just a lot of thermal inertia. Because this is much bigger than before, like before we did with a half inch tube, you yeah. saw how tiny those things were and we were using, um, well, different heater elements, but uh, much, much less volume involved in that. Yeah. Um, so yeah, you could be building it up and then it's just, it's a big, big amount of mass, including that plate, the whole metal plate, it's all, that bottom plate is metal and that's all directly connected to the one inch tube, so that's got a lot of mass there, Yeah. Uh, quite a bit of mass. And uh, they rarely heat up as much. Like they, you can usually touch them with your finger. Like you need to go further than five inches above the the last heating element to be able to like touch the tube. We love to like you don't get 160 degrees mm. in there. Yeah, well, I think we might want to just make sure we're patient to give it enough time, observe that it stabilizes. So typically it was like if you set it to 240, you turn it off and you typically have what, like the overshoot to like 280? That was normal or? Like uh, this was slightly above 300 maybe. Okay. But I started turning it off before we got there. Mm -hmm. you know, and let the system reevaluate to see if it's already above. Uh, mm -hmm. Well, like before it overshoots, before before the temperature has reached 240, I turned it off, so I don't mm -hmm. hit that overshoot. Yesterday I did, and I went all the way up to 320. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe set it to like very conservative, like say 160, and walk away and see when when you come back that it should be pretty stable around it. Yeah. And then walk away, set it to like 180 or. Yeah. Just keep going until we understand like that feature. The first uh, thing I'll need to do is disassemble it. Yeah. No. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, and then maybe the thermistors might be unreliable. 
whenever I turn the machine on, it misses the display like minus 60 degrees. I don't, I don't know if that's an artifact that that could just connect to the metal or like. Shouldn't it shouldn't have mass cold. No. Yeah. Or it's like working temperature that is, uh, that is below. Maybe the only efficient would be it's between plus 10 degrees upwards or something. Are we using the same one as the 3D printer? Mm, yeah. The, oh, well. The, one, one, the metal one of cartridge ones or the glass? Both, both actually. The lower one is the metal one, and the top one is the glass one. Um, and there's the, the wires are burned on it, and there's, there's, there's still something to do with efficient reading, which, but they're taking some damage. What are those made for? Like, what kind of temperature range are those supposed to be? Like, I think they're like. Temperature range? I think. I mean, 260 at least, that's the max setting. We never set, set it to more than that on a 3D printer. Yeah. Um, well, it should be. I um, mm, forget what it is, but there's uh, uh, thermistor. Wrap, wrap cartridge thermistor. We can take a look at that. Um, Standard ones. Okay, let's say the 104 GT thermistor. 300 C. Um, yeah, that's the kind of one we use. Well, maybe use the same one. Um, we know it's working well on the 3D printer. I mean, we we can get pretty good temperature um, so the temperature range should be good on that yeah it's just the heating elements are way more aggressive well, why would we be reading so low though with on startup though because um, that's with Wes's code no I think that's just the Both? library and how it reads temperatures uh, Yeah. Because I never see it like I mean I've never seen uh, like just the experience with the printers if it's cold like it goes down to you know a few degrees C it's the lowest I've ever seen it when, when this building was unheated. Yeah, and then we start so. heating it, it quickly goes up, and then when it reaches like plus temperatures, it starts seemingly you know, accurate reading. Mm -hmm. It might be the damage that happened to them. I mean they they monitor some sort of voltage drop or something and. They're burning maybe that lower range gets lowered, but I'm, yeah, pre I mean, I'm pretty it's sure it's accurate when it's when, it, when it's measuring 200 degrees. I'm pretty sure it's accurate. So I use the laser uh, mm -hmm. thermometer. Uh, it's not too far off. Mm -hmm. But I, then again, I can't really measure where the emitter is. I'm on the outside of the tube. Yeah, that's what I was going to suggest. Is some kind of clarification of the temperature by using the laser, especially in the high Yeah. Yeah, basically it's up to the code that somebody wrote for measuring thermistors. Uh, so thermistors are only measuring the so yeah. to the higher end of their temperature range. You can get an accuracy for some of the other just like, oh yeah, if you see uh, the voltage change at 22, that means there's a temperature change at 100 degrees or something like that. Then it's going to be an accurate on the lower rather than the high side. So, yeah. So, yeah. Or if they actually Yeah, and, and, and then I, I, I think the heating of the plastic parts did make a difference of drying them out. So the quality of the film coming out initially, but to actually make it into a viable solution where you heat up and dry off enough plastic to the feed into the machine and have as little time gap in between the feeding as possible is in itself uh, a machine. 
that. So the way it's been acting and the way it's been using it's just been extremely practical to the point that yeah, we need to maybe try to work for it. Let it be the of this kind of thing. Yeah. So what's the best plan for right now then? Opening it up, see what happens with the tube. Uh, hopefully it's not cleaning time, that'll take five hours. <laughs> we have two of these. And then as that is done, uh, I'll ask someone to help me uh, take it down. And mm -hmm. start mounting it to a table or make a stand for it. Or yeah. Change the feed with the feeding mechanism in so that you know it has to be loaded from a 90 degrees angle rather than. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And then make sure when we do that, so yeah, that let the temperature stabilize. Like, let's not go further until that, that's like completely stable. Um, yeah. Hopefully. Try with one, or like you still want to do the two, two heater bands. I mean, uh, say I, I I change the whole configuration. Uh, I I would see how the temperature acts without ever feeding plastic into it. So I'll start out with two. And I, if I for some reason don't get a, a even temperature, yeah, at that point I might just disconnect the cables to one and see what happens. And two, you like because you want to make sure you're you've got I mean, enough I heat or. So I can just see, and if, if it is it's at a stable temperature, I think it's optimal to use that because the auger needs a little bit of help with, with enough plastic in the I'd say. Mm -hmm. But say I want to pivot away from that, all I have to do is disconnect the cables. So I'd rather mount them than have to put them on afterwards because uh, it needs to disassemble the whole nozzle structure to be able to do that. Or Because the, the nozzle is too fat, you can't get them over without that? Well, actually, I, I, I widened one heating element to be over that fat area. And then the area on top of it is slightly smaller. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You can, you can bend it up and get it out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah, uh, setting a lower temperature using one heating element is definitely valid approaches, but first of all, the, 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 the yeah, okay.